Amen. Thank you. Chancel Choir and Handbell Choir for that beautiful, uh, beautiful music. A couple of things this morning before uh, we begin the sermon. Once we get through uh, Holy Week and Easter, we will uh, turn our attention to uh, stewardship, which is where we talk about supporting uh, our church for another year. But I want to recommend a book to you, one that I mentioned a couple of years ago. The book is called Enough uh, by a guy named Adam Hamilton. And if you're somebody who's ever wrestled with money, if you've ever wrestled with being restless and feeling unfulfilled, if you've ever wrestled with fear or discontentment, then I think you will get a lot out of this book. Uh, so I recommend that to you, and we have copies down in our bookstore. The next thing I want to say is that our disciples class, which is made up of our fifth graders that are going to be baptized uh, the week after Easter, uh, will do their confessions of faith on Easter and then be baptized in two weeks. And there are 19 of them. And uh, about 18 of them came over to my house Friday night uh, to uh, roast marshmallows and cook s'mores. It was like 28 degrees outside, but they still wanted to come. And, um, and we had a good night. And I talked to them about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to make a confession of faith, what it means to be baptized into the church. And then I turned the tables and said, okay, now you can ask me questions, and, uh, which is dangerous. And one of them put up his hand, and I, and I said, yes, he said, how much money do you make? <laughs> and I said, I refuse, or I, I reserve the right to not answer questions that I don't want to answer. But um, what a great group of young people, and they've learned a lot with Justin and with their mentors, and we look forward to uh, their being baptized here in just a couple of weeks. I hope you'll come this week and be a part of Holy Week on Thursday and on Friday. Uh, it is a, the most special week of the year. Uh, for Christians, and so I hope that you will come and uh, observe these services and, and walk through Holy Week with us. Join me for a word of prayer. Loving God, open our hearts and minds once again to hear these words of Scripture, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of, uh, all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are a rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Matthew tells us in his gospel that Jesus had carefully uh, planned this out. He sent two disciples into a town and said, You will find a donkey and a colt tied up. Bring them to me, and if anybody asks you why you need them, tell them the Lord needs them. And of course, this was to fulfill what was written by the prophet Zechariah, who said, Lo, your king comes to you humble and mounted on a donkey. Zechariah says he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. And the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. So picture this. It's Passover time in Jerusalem. There's about two and a half, maybe close to three million people crowded into that city. The law at the time said that every adult Jewish male who lived within 20 miles had to come to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. So it's crowded. The people were waiting with great anticipation for the coming of their king, a king from the lineage of David, this man named Jesus. They had heard about Jesus and all that he had done. They had heard about his teachings and his healings. Uh, they had heard how he made the blind see and the deaf hear and the dead live again. Uh, he had challenged the authorities and, and called them out. And so they're waiting for him to come into the city they line the streets, they wave palm branches, they put their cloaks on the ground, which is how they would greet a king in that day. Expectations were high, excitement abounded. They said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save us now. And here comes Jesus. He enters Jerusalem, not with a mighty procession, not with soldiers, spears, armor, horses, but humble, riding on a donkey. Every year when we approach Holy Week, I find myself wrestling with a question. I think it's a question worth wrestling with, and that question is this. Was Jesus Christ a political person? There's been a lot of debate over that throughout the years, but if we look at the way that Holy Week unfolds, we might just get uh, some answers to that question. There's lots of scholars that have written on this subject. I've read a lot of them. I, I wrote a, 
a short piece for the paper yesterday uh, talking about this question a, a little bit. Um, there's two guys that I've spent a lot of time researching uh, during my time at Suwannee. One is uh, Adam Hamilton, who is a Methodist pastor. The other is Stanley Har Harawas, who is an ethicist at Duke uh, University. But this is what Harawas says in his commentary on this passage. Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is an unmistakable political act. He has come to be acknowledged as king. He's the son of David, the one long expected to free Jerusalem from foreign domination. Yet this king triumphs not through violent revolt, but by being for Israel the one who is able to show it that its worship of God is its freedom. He is Israel's long expected priestly king whom the prophet said would come. His entry into Jerusalem is therefore rightly celebrated by those who were not in power. Can you imagine that first Palm Sunday? The Jews were expecting a warrior. They were expecting somebody that could liberate them from the Romans who were occupying their land. They were expecting a grand entry like that of Pontius Pilate. But here comes Jesus, humble, hippie-looking guy, probably wearing sandals, riding on a donkey. Different than what they thought. Reminding us that the kingdom of God is very different from the kingdoms of this world. Once he enters Jerusalem, Matthew tells us that the first thing Jesus did is go to the temple. What happens at the temple? He gets angry at the money changers and he causes a scene. He turns over the tables and he quotes Jewish scripture by saying, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers from Jeremiah. Jesus is angry. Harawas says going to the temple is perhaps even more significant than his entry into Jerusalem. The temple defines Israel. The worship of God and political obedience are inseparable. The abuses surrounding the temple and Israel's political subjugation are but aspects of the same political reality. You see, Rome had figured out the best way to occupy the land. And what they did was they paid the chief priests and the religious leaders in that day money to keep the people in check. And it was in their interest to not let anything get out of hand because they were being paid. They had sold out. N.T. Wright, who's a British scholar, says that Jerusalem had lost its way so drastically, somehow the leaders of the Jewish people had gotten things so wrong in their collusion with Rome and in their corruption, oppression, and greed, somehow the Jewish people, Jesus' own people, had gotten things so wrong in their determination to bring God's victory to the world through military violence and armed rebellion that the only word the last of the prophets can now speak is what we find in Matthew 24. Not one stone will be left standing upon another. All of them will be thrown down. The temple will be destroyed. Of course, Jesus was no fool. He knew that going to Jerusalem with a loud procession and causing a scene at the temple in the middle of Passover would be problematic, and it would not lead to a happy ending. In fact, he had predicted it three times throughout Matthew's gospel. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised. But the disciples never really got it. They said, Jesus, what are you talking about? Stop talking like that. Later in the week, we find Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus did not like what he saw when he got to the temple. And he showed incredible courage in confronting the authorities, the same courage that he had shown throughout his life and his ministry. But Jesus knew how it would end. He knew that you can't challenge the system. You can't 
challenge the powers that be without there being serious consequences. So I wrestle with that question. Was Jesus a political person? Most scholars say yes. But I don't think that there is a clear connection between the politics of Jesus and the politics that we espouse today as much. For example, I'll offer this to you. When I was in seminary at Princeton from 2002 until 2005, um, when George Bush was president, there were a lot of people that were very uh, angry at the government and very anti-establishment in the name of Jesus. But I don't often hear the same people be the same way when you get a new regime in. What I'm saying is we are called to be Christians first and then Republicans, then Democrats, but Christians first. Jesus knew you can't challenge the system without there being consequences. N.T. Wright says that is part of the mystery of his crucifixion. Wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity, he cannot establish a new creation without allowing the poison in the old to have its full effect. He cannot launch God's kingdom of justice, truth, and peace unless injustice, lies, and violence do their worst and like a hurricane blow themselves out, exhausting their force on this one spot. He cannot begin the work of healing the world unless he provides the antidote to the infection that would otherwise destroy the project from within. You see, Jesus exposed our world of violence and intimidation for what it is. N.T. Wright says this is where it all comes together. Holy Week. We see how the early work of Jesus' public career, the healings, the celebrations, the forgiveness, the changed hearts, all look forward to this one moment. This is what it looks like when Israel's God becomes king. Jesus showed incredible courage. What about us? Do we show courage? Many of us, when we're faced with our own Jerusalems in life, are quick to turn around and go the other way. Many of us are good at avoiding conflict and confrontation, and we do everything in our, can, in, in our power to just keep it from happening. We run, and we hide, and we lie, and we go back on our word, and we get two-faced, often unwilling to face up to some of the most difficult situations in life that need to be addressed. For example, my own fraternity, SAE, has been in the news the last couple weeks. The uh, SAE chapter at Oklahoma had a party, and they were all riding home together on a bus, and they started singing a song that was very racist. And uh, somebody happened to uh, capture it on video, and it went viral. Instead of somebody standing up and saying, stop, knock it off, there's no place for that, they joined in, and they started singing. I want to be left out. It takes courage to stand up for what's right. It may not be popular. It takes courage. What do we make of the events of Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week? First, I'd say that the fact that Jesus' kingdom was and still is very different from the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world are based on power and money, intimidation and fear, force and violence, but Jesus' kingdom is based on love and forgiveness, grace and reconciliation, peace and hospitality, humility and service to others. And yes, as Christians who live in this world, we are constantly being pulled back and forth between the two. But many don't understand that Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of peace. Pilate's horse and chariot were symbols of war, but Jesus' donkey was a symbol of peace. Throughout his life and ministry, he showed us that he came not to destroy, but to love, not to condemn, but to help, not to judge, but to forgive. But we still often have a hard time getting that. Because the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, is so different than what we know. 
Jesus was passionately committed to speaking out against injustice and oppression, and he did so boldly. Secondly, Palm Sunday reminds us that courage is a gift that comes from God. And all of us are called to face Jerusalem on some level. But sometimes when we show courage, there are consequences. There were consequences for Jesus. What are the Jerusalems that we face? Perhaps it's poverty. Maybe it's homelessness and hunger. Maybe it's racism and bigotry. Maybe it's even closer to home. Maybe it's cancer or illness of some sort. Maybe it's fear itself. Maybe it's coming to terms with something that we did in our past and we can't get over it. Maybe it's being willing to go and mend a relationship that's been broken uh, with a spouse or with a, a parent or a child or a family member or a friend. We don't want to keep living life anymore without mending that relationship. Dealing with any and all these things takes courage, and I think the courage is a gift that comes from God. Jesus, Jesus showed incredible courage when he entered Jerusalem, and he calls us to show the same courage when we have to deal with injustices and difficult situations in our own day. I think courage comes through prayer. Courage comes from supporting each other in a community. And courage also comes from making peace with death itself, because I don't think that any of us are truly free to live in this world until we are free to die. Third, in life, we need to learn that we worship a God of surprises. And sometimes God has a better plan for us than we could ever imagine on our own. Sometimes God speaks to us in ways that we might not ever expect. Think of all those people in Jerusalem waiting for the, the king, the liberator, the warrior to come. And then all of a sudden, here comes this hippie-looking guy riding on a donkey. What a sight. What a surprise. What a contrast to what they had experienced. What a turn of events. It's not supposed to be this way. How's this guy going to overthrow the government and save us? How's this guy going to be the one that we've been waiting for all these years? How's this guy going to put an end to oppression and exploitation? But life is full of surprises. And sometimes when we think we know better, God shows up. And God is the master of surprises. Life is anything but dull and predictable, especially when you trust in God. Palm Sunday, I think, also reminds us that people are fickle because it's the same people that, that, that wave the palm branches and welcome Jesus into Jerusalem that just a couple of days later were saying, crucify him, crucify him, free Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. There's something about violence that gets human beings excited. The news people know that. ISIS will always make a great story. Gets our adrenaline going. Even a few of Jesus' closest followers turned on him and betrayed him. And isn't that true in life? It's the people that you know the best and that you trust the most who have the potential to hurt you the deepest. We have to understand that the way of Christ is the way of the cross. I mean, we have this symbol that's on the stained glass all over our culture, on necklaces and earrings and, and you name it. But I wonder how many people really understand what the cross is all about. Uh, we are the only religion that worships somebody who was executed by the authorities. The way of Christ is the way of pain and agony and suffering. And it's tempting to skip from today to Easter. But if you don't walk through Monday, Thursday in the upper room and Good Friday in the pain and anguish, then Easter doesn't have a real meaning. There's so many Christians that just want their faith to be about being happy and fulfilled and a better life for you now. But Jesus was crucified. And it's what's unique about our faith because he understands our pain. He lived it. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to come up against a force that can put you to death. Uh, he knows that life is not always easy and happy. And we have to deal with illness and shortcomings and hardship and disappointment and loss and devastation and struggle and ultimately death itself. 
But because of Christ, we know that death does not have the final say. Death does not win. Love wins, and hope wins, and resurrection wins, and life 